Well, good afternoon, and I want to welcome you to another episode of The Fireplace Show. The Fire Show, Fireplace Show is produced and presented by our company, CBC Success Group. And the intent of The Fireplace Show is to share information about fireplaces, chimneys, hearth appliances, and other items in a way that consumers can understand what they have. Now, also during our presentations, if you're registered at StreamYard to allow them to use your name in this, you can come right on, ask us a question, and myself or the guests will answer the questions for you. So every week I try to go out and find what I call a subject matter expert. And a subject matter expert is one that can speak to consumers with authority. And this is no different today because the gentleman that I have here, I met him some years ago. I was teaching a course called a D&D in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And Bill Ryan, who's my guest today, was there. So my guest today is a gentleman by the name of Bill Ryan. And Bill was basically raised in the chimney industry. And with that, I'm going to let Bill tell you a little bit about what he's, where he's been through in his life and what all he does today. So Bill, tell folks a little bit about yourself here, please, sir. So I am essentially a second generation chimney professional. Uh, my dad was a professional firefighter in the city of Orange, New Jersey. And uh, in the mid seventies, he uh, started to see a lot of fire loss related to chimneys in his in his town and as a paid fireman they were worked swing shifts and he had days off and instead of washing windows or putting up fences he decided to go into the chimney business and um, by 1980 I uh, six years old uh, started going out on Saturdays with my dad to service chimneys and uh, that progressed until I was about 10 and my father realized I had some kind of interest in everything. And I was handed a copy of the NFPA 211, which is the, the standard of care, the 1984 version. And I read it and I learned it at 10 years old. And I started talking about chimneys at a technical level. Fast forward to college age. Uh, my dad was ready to retire from the fire department, which meant he also wanted to retire from chimneys. And he said, hey, you know, you could do this on the side if you want. While I was in college, in high school, I was doing chimney sweeping and minor maintenance for teachers and uh, friends of uh, parents of friends and, and uh, people that just needed chimneys around town and where I was going to college. And uh, here I am, 26 years later, 27 years later, uh, running a, a, a couple of different businesses related to the chimney industry, uh, chimney sweep and maintenance and restoration company and a consulting firm that uh, focuses on litigation support and some small business coaching uh, inside the industry ma mainly. Uh, I am a three-quarter time chimney inspector uh, when I am not doing other things. I am in the field still. I really enjoy being with chimneys and learning about them. The great thing about this trade and the great thing about chimneys in general is that every day I see something new on a chimney inspection. Uh, they're like snowflakes and uh, they're very unique chimneys are, especially these field built masonry chimneys. We get to really use our craft to help keep people safe, uh, you know, by practicing this trade. And with that said, I have been a student of this uh, industry for, for basically 40 years. And um, I continue to learn every day. And uh, I've learned from some great people in this industry, Jerry included. And I appreciate, thank you, Jerry, for the invitation today. Um, a lot of people during the, the course of my career have taught me a lot of things that have allowed me to uh, continue my growth. And I still do that today and, and try to share that with the consumer public and the chimney industry as well. Right. And probably a lot of people have been through classes with Bill. You shared a lot of training with people around the country. It's one of the things you do. Hopefully, I'm hoping maybe I was able to inspire you some years years ago to enter and become this instructor. So hopefully maybe I had some influence in what you're doing today. You absolutely do, Jerry. Uh, that first class for me, that D&D &D class was my first turning point uh, of my career. And, you know, not to be too boring about it. So I sat in the front row. I sit in the front row of every class that I take. And Jerry, you've been an instructor in many of those classes. I always sit in the front row because I want to get as much as I can from the speaker. And uh, for me, the uh, turning point was the using a closed caption camera device on every chimney. And I learned that in the year 2000 from that class that Jerry taught along with uh, Tom Urban and Ken Robinson. 
And uh, at the time, I remember this specifically, the statistic was 11 companies in the country were scanning everything that they, they serviced. And I vowed that day to become the 12th and I've never looked back. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I'm the 12th company nationally to use a camera on every chimney uh, as part of our inspection process. And this actually predates the levels of inspection for our trade as well. Right. So Bill, you said something a while ago, and it's one of the tools that you and many chimney inspectors and chimney service people in the United States use today, which is an interior video inspection system. And this is where you take a camera and actually lower it in the chimney. So you're looking at it from mere inches away. They have focused. You can move these around, look at different angles. So tell people how important it is to have this actual interior video inspection done. And what does it tell us or what does it tell the consumer? How does it enable the chimney service technician to service the customer better? So the use of a camera is uh, really something you should be asking of all your chimney professionals. Uh, it, what it does is it provides the chimney professional with really valuable information that cannot be seen with the naked eye. It can't be seen with a flashlight and a mirror always, which was the old time way of doing things. Uh, it, there's a lot of things that are hidden deficiencies that the camera does expose. And those deficiencies, if not found, continue to be a potentially hazardous condition inside of a chimney system in a home and, and become a, a hazard when the system is used. Uh, so uh, it also sheds light on some construction deficiency, which does exist in the field. Uh, it'll shed light on potential openings in the chimney. Uh, it'll shed light on animal entry or any type of pest that could have uh, made a home inside of a chimney from any portion of the chimney from the bottom to the top or from the top to the bottom, depending on the method of the camera uh, usage. Okay. Well, today, what we're doing here and what we want to share with the listeners that are out there, and if you're in the profession, please, please feel free to share this on your own social pages. But what we're here is to talk about what I call the dangers that lurk behind the walls, under the floors, and the ceilings. And before we go further, I'm going to play a short video and I'm going to tell you this is pretty dramatic and this is a recent loss in Sugarland, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston, Texas. So this will last a little over a minute, but I'm going to play this video for our listeners, Bill. A grandmother and three young children trying to keep warm killed in a fire. It happened at a home on Vista Lakes near Edgewater. That's in the First Colony neighborhood. Grace White has this devastating story. Sugarland investigators tell us they've learned from the family's social media post they were using a fireplace inside this house to stay warm overnight. The cause of the fire officially is still under investigation, but we've also learned the mother who survived was disoriented and taken to a hospital in the medical center. Investigators are still waiting to learn if it was in fact carbon monoxide poisoning. This all happened around two o'clock this morning in First Colony. The neighborhood had been without power for eight Eight hours. A 75 year old grandmother and three elementary aged children were found dead upstairs. Their mother and a friend survived. Emergency crews say they had to restrain the mom to keep her from going back inside to try and save her children. You can see from the damage just how intense this fire was, making it harder for investigators to determine exactly how it started. In Sugarland, Grace White, KHOU 11 News. So, Bill, when you see that, what goes through your mind? Uh, it's a one that got away from our industry. We have an opportunity, if we get a chance to see that fireplace, to potentially prevent that loss. Uh, we don't know what the cause was, so we don't know if that's 100% true. But that's what goes through my mind. And, and our job, and I, I talk to my people about this all the time, our job is to prevent that from happening. That's our goal. We never want that to be the result of someone using uh, their fireplace or, or appliance. Uh, when I see stuff like this, I just think it could be anything from user error all the way up to, you know, lack of maintenance uh, and, and anything in between. Uh, so it's, it's a tragedy that I don't like the fact that the, that goes into our statistics. And it, it does reflect on chimneys in general. And I just believe that we can prevent many of these losses in the field by being better professional. 
Right. And that, that's what it's all about, Bill. I mean, when we look at these things and we see them. So here's my question to you. Number one, being a chimney inspector in the present day world with all the information that we possess, and that's what you and I train people. We both train on chimney inspections, documentation, analysis, and other things. Right. So what you, you know, what you're looking at here is problems that potentially could have been spotted by an expert by doing a simple chimney inspection. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And, and if we don't spot it on the simple inspection, we may have clues to look further. And th those would have been present potentially on a regular uh, chimney maintenance visit and, and a simple inspection. Correct. Because one of the big things is, is we have a lot of concealed issues behind walls. In fact, that's one of the reasons you talked about the NFPA 211 inspection standards, which has what we're going to call a level one, a level two, and a level three. And under the level three, it's when we actually tear the walls down and we start looking at things. It's what I get involved in from the fire investigation side when I'm called in as an expert for a legal, for a legal, uh, lawyer that has been involved in this. But again, what are the things that you see that are very common that your customers are shocked when you share with them? I guess the number one thing uh, on this list is going to be wood used in construction of the lower portions of the chimney. Uh, and, and so what that means to a consumer is uh, at some point during construction, the builder of the chimney used a piece of plywood or a piece of flooring or several pieces of flooring or some kind of combustible to support portions of construction. Uh, very frequently, we find this is still in place and it connects to framing of the home sometimes. And many times it's it has charring on it or it has already combusted in its current position. Uh, so that's the number one thing that we're seeing as far as a construction defect that shocks people the most. Okay, so that's because I know actually one of my clients shared a picture. They're located in eastern Pennsylvania, which is not far from you. Nope. And he, he took they took a masonry chimney all the way down to the floor. And when they did, they found that the floor joists were right where the inner hearth, the fireplace floor, and the outer hearth, which is the hearth extension or whatever you want to call it, right on that area. And they had a beam running right underneath one layer of fire brick. And it was severely charred in that area, but they're taking it down. But this usually we don't see this kind of stuff, but it's what exists, especially what I'm seeing is you're in what I call the mid-Atlantic states. Yes. And in the mid-Atlantic states, this seems to be a severe issue of wood under the fireplace inner hearth or what you as a consumer would call the fireplace floor where you burn the wood. So how often do you run into this problem, Bill? Uh, honestly, it's between 65 and 70% of the time in masonry fireplaces, and the demographic is homes built uh, post-World War II, uh, typically pre-war period. We don't see it. Uh, post-World War II when construction was rapid and uh, maybe slightly less skilled, uh, we see a lot of it. And, and, and right through the 60s, 70s, and 80s construction, uh, before the factory built movement really took hold here, um, 65, 70% of the fireplaces we see have some type of combustible in the lower portion, uh, either uh, other under the inner hearth or the hearth extension. And, and I agree with that. And there's a whole thing, Bill. Let me ask you this. How do you find it when you're doing that inspection? How do you and your guys determine that we've got wood under this fireplace floor? And keep it in mind, we have both consumers and we have a lot of chimney service technicians in there. So in one way, this is kind of a seminar for people that may not be used sure. to this. We're going to try to keep the conversation in consumer terms. But what do you do? How do you find these problems since they're concealed under that brick? Well, first and foremost, we use our eyes. Uh, we go below the system when it is accessible uh, and that includes crawl spaces that may not be too pleasant um, we get in there we get underneath the system we're looking for uh, the actual the visual presence of wood and or the evidence that it may can uh, communicate with uh, wood uh, but secondly we use the camera we put the camera down the ash pit and we look around uh, from there so that camera serves uh, multi-functions for us in the truck and that's the internal inspection camera uh, many times we can see it visually, but a lot of times we have to use our, our concealed equipment tools 
and and that's something that comes up quite often. And and like you asked previously, it is the thing that shocks homeowners the most. And most consumers will see that wood the same time we see it and say, well, that shouldn't be there because it's kind of common sense. Other times when we put it down there and, and you see the charring, you get that that actual dramatic reaction. And, you know, that's that's someone breathing a sigh of relief of luck. If you, if you have charring under there and you're an aggressive user of your fireplace, you're very close to having worse things occur in that system. Right. So Bill, let's do this. I'm going to ask you to explain this in consumer oriented terms so people can understand what happens when wood is heated. It's a process we call pyrolysis or we commonly call it vaporization day. So could you share with the people watching the show and explain to them what is the pyrolysis or vaporization process? What's going on? So in consumer terms, and, and I will preface this by saying one of the questions we feel most commonly is, well, how is this a problem now? It's been like this for a long period of time. And right inside that question is the answer. Um, over time, uh, that combustible material uh, will slowly dry out with exposure to heat uh, and even just to dry ambient air. Over time, the combustion temperature drops and drops and drops until eventually it only takes a heat source to ignite it. Doesn't need a flame, doesn't need a spark, doesn't need an ember. The heat source transferring to that combustible material will eventually be enough to ignite it. Uh, it takes a long time in some circumstances, and in other circumstances, it happens quite rapidly. It's really uh, chimney specific or, or circumstance specific that indicates the timing of it. Uh, and, and again, one of the things that happens is kind of what will happen in Texas here uh, when a fireplace is only occasionally used and then it is put into full time service for survival, uh, that process becomes exponentially worse because you are running a, an appliance for a longer period of time, more heat exposure, uh, more consistent and long term heat exposure. So from a consumer perspective, Pyrolysis is the drying out of that combustible material over time and heat and other factors until it can ignite without a flame source. Right. So let me add a couple of things to that. If we go down to the lumber yard and we buy a brand new piece of lumber and we're building a house, it's going to take about 650 degrees of temperature to have ignition or combustion occur. But what happens each and every time that that material is heated, that ignition temperature drops minutely. Now, we may be talking about a percentage of a degree at a time, but over a period, 20, 30, 40 years, all of a sudden it hits that magic point. It has enough heat there. The wood is dropped to that point and all the ingredients now are right for bad things to happen and that's the occurrence so like i said what bill's saying is commonly people will tell a chimney inspector well hey it's been like you know we haven't had no problems up to this point but you know i kind of bill i kind of compare it to what happened on me on january 20th i never had a problem with my heart and one sudden one day decided okay jerry it's time to have a heart attack okay and that you know and that's how this occurs and that's what people have got to be wary of is these things can take many, many years, 30, 40, 50 years. It's not that uncommon. And a while ago, you said you commonly found this in homes, that, the wood in houses that were built 50 and 60 years ago, right after World War II. Would that be correct? That's correct. OK, so here's another one for you, Bill. We've got the wood under the fireplace. We know this. But another problem is the chimney on the inside of your house behind the walls is actually supposed to have two inches of clearance. Correct. Four on the backside. Right. Um, I'm talking about the chimney behind the fireplace on the backside, the fireplace, four inches. Yeah. And recently I just got pictures of a house fire that started from wood directly up against the back wall of the fireplace. Yep. But if you go up through the chimney system, you're supposed to maintain two inches of clearance. Bill, how often do you think we find that, that we find that two inches of clearance? Uh, almost never. Statistically, it doesn't register on a percentage scale. 
Yeah, and that's the problem. So commonly, let's talk about the fireplace, you know, and we think the following, brick don't burn. But if you look at your fireplace over there, you may have brick, you may have stone, you may have tile, you may have granite, you may have any number of different facing or facing materials or facades. But what a lot of people don't understand is many times there's a studded wall right in behind that facade. And that studded wall many times is supported by the brick right above the fireplace. Now, do you see that, Bill? We see this quite often. Uh, that area, the throat slash smoke chamber transition or header area uh, is commonly touching the fireplace or the chimney system where we are required to have significantly more thickness of masonry and clearance the combustibles. Right. And then another problem, Mary Bill. So a lot of times you guys will go into an attic to do part of the inspection if it's accessible. Am I, am I right on this? Yeah, correct. So as it comes through, we should be finding the framing should be two inches away from that chimney. If we look at it in the attic floor and there should be metal fire stopping at this area to stop the airflow up there. in today's world and codes and standards is calling fire blocking, but at fire stopping fire blocking. So this is one of the things you as a consumer can do. So if you can get into your attic, simply go up in the attic and look around the brick. And if the wood is touching the brick, Bill, what should they do? They should call a chimney professional, have the rest of the chimney evaluated, and then ask for the processes that potentially could help mitigate this circumstance. And there are different ways to address this. Right, because within the industry now, knowing that this has been an issue, we've invented fireplaces that are made to, uh, firebox replacements that right. are made to operate with this lack of clearance on that four inches behind it and underneath the floor. And then we have liner systems that go through and they are listed for the wood to touch it but this is not used in common masonry construction out there today. So there are answers to this, if you just have to get that right person to give you the right ideas on this thing. So you, you got to be looking at this. Bill, one of the things I tell people to do is to look at any staining on the chimney outside, like darkened staining, you see it's mildew look or whatever, because this is an indication that we may have problems with the mortar in the chimney where it's softened and falling out between the flue tiles. The flue tiles, the flue liner, if you look at the picture behind me, you can see that terracotta pipe. You see it right there coming behind me in the photo. Well, those are usually in 12 inch or 24 inch lengths. So in between there, we have a mortar. So Bill, do you commonly find that the mortar between those flue tiles is washed away, softened, and is gone? A very, very high percentage of the time that we perform a chimney inspection, we do find uh, mortar joints missing, damaged, or incomplete. Uh, and that's sometimes over time, sometimes it's, it's construction defect, sometimes it's water related. Uh, so it really does depend on, uh, again, chimney circumstances that will dictate the reasons when people ask those questions. And a lot of times, when you're dealing with multi-flue chimneys, when you have two of those conduits in a chimney uh, and they not are constructed properly, the another whole aspect comes into it where those mortar joints are being attacked from one side only and we'll find them missing on that wall. So there's so many things that could be, but it's very common that those mortar joints are missing and it's very common that we find that there is evidence of flue gas migration and soot and creosote and other things outside the intended wall of the, of the chimney liner. Right. If you look at the chimney over my, you're looking at over my left shoulder, you can see that there's two chimney caps there and there's two, two terracotta pipes coming out, which is what we call the flue liner. Now, commonly, that smaller flue is going to be going to a central heating system. It could be, you know, I hope this comes out right, an oil boiler. They say, I can't say all right up in your part of the country. It could be a furnace. It could be a gas appliance. It could be a domestic hot water heater. Sure. But often these need a sleeve put into them, a stainless steel reline. Why do they need that, Bill? What's the problem here? From a homeowner's perspective, the best thing for you to know is that appliances have continued to improve in their efficiencies and their combustion processes, and their byproducts continue to get more and uh, more cooler and more acidic. The, the byproducts actually uh, contain all kinds of reactions to masonry products. In fact, 
it can be argued that common to uh, modern day heating appliances uh, are just simply not designed for for masonry chimneys and and vitreous clay flue liners, uh, but they are they're they're installed there, and so these stainless liners or in some cases aluminum liners um, can mitigate that issue uh, by containing those byproducts in a more uh, suitable material, uh, more resistant to corrosion than that masonry. But the low temperatures and the high acidity of oil burning, uh, higher efficient gas burning, even mid efficient gas burning or water heaters all by themselves um, can create all kinds of damage from these uh, acidic residues and moisture content from the flue gases. Right. And I'm sure you're old enough and you've been in this business long enough to remember when many people were switching from oil as a fuel over to gas some years ago. Mm -hmm. And what was happening at that point was we were propping, we were pumping a lot of high condensation amounts into the chimney. It mixed with the oil soot, which is sulfur, made sulfuric acid in the chimney. And it's a very acidic mix that ate the inside of chimneys up. Do you remember those days? Absolutely. I have the scars to prove it. OK, <laughs> and then today, it's my understanding now that the oil side of the industry, the fuel oil side, has now developed super efficient boiler systems that are up in your part of the country, going up into New York, New Jersey, all through those mid-Atlantic states. And now the oil systems are so efficient that they are now pumping out highly corrosive acids that are going into the chimney. Is this a factor in chimney safety also? It is. And this is where it's important to be uh, as a homeowner or a consumer um, involved in the process of a change out of an oil appliance uh, that your heating contractor and your chimney contractor kind of work together. Um, the newer oil appliances are extremely efficient, uh, but the exhaust is super acidic. It, it will it will chew away at a masonry chimney in a very short period of time. And the solution is not that expensive. And, and it, most of the time it's considered permanent. You, you put a 30-year boiler in, you'll get a 30-year uh, lining system at the same time. We've gotten even further than that. Some of the newer oil appliances are now using plastic flexible lining systems. Um, and, and that's a, a brand new, well, not brand new, but it's a, a, a burgeoning technology that um, is now on the scene. And many uh, uh, chimney and heating contractors just aren't on the same page with this. Uh, and, and it's important for everybody to work together on that so that you don't end up with a large ticket chimney rebuild or removal of, of some material from your chimney that end up costing a lot of money as opposed to addressing this from, from the beginning of a change out. Right. So again, what you really got to do, and Bill, you know that I train heavy and you train heavy also. And we both travel across the United States and I do a lot of online training. In fact, I've got a course tomorrow online. And this is, it takes more than a couple hours to educate people. And yes. I think this is one of our frustrations, Bill. Do you ever go on to Facebook forums that consumers are on and see really bad advice being offered by homeowners, what I'm going to call the layman, that have no idea what they're talking about? I do. Um, several pages. And, and although as a professional, I do try to help many times, my words are not taken uh, as serious. And sometimes that's financial. Sometimes that's just people believing they know better. Uh, and, and granted, I'm still learning and I will always learn about this trade. When I go on these homeowner pages, I see some things that are going to end up resulting in loss. And uh, our, our industry knows that this is out there and we do try to help. I watch my my colleagues get very in-depth in these conversations and, um, and that and combined with DIY uh, TV and, and, and program, you know, shows and programs and uh, that people are seeing some of this stuff that just isn't safely accurate. Um, we can do more, but education takes a long time and, and just saying Hey guys, let's let's address this properly. This is not the right way to do this. And the shutdown response is, well, your way is going to cost too much money. I don't have a comeback to that. Um, my way is going to cost you money to do it the way that's going to prevent the loss or the potential loss. I, I don't know what your way is going to result in, but I know that visually it's not right. And I know that according to the words that have been shared on some of these pages, loss is going to occur 
in some of these circumstances. It's almost um, a guarantee. I, I think you'd probably agree with some of what you've seen. Right. And I want to go, I want to dwell a little bit over to another side because there's also other issues with house fires. So Bill, I'm going to share another short video that I hope is going to be really informative. So we're going to play this one. This will take about a minute and a half to play. So stay with us. I think you'll find this really interesting. Crews tore down a Connecticut home where three children and their grandparents died in a fire Christmas morning. Cell phone video shows how flames quickly spread through the house just before 5 a.m. First units on the scene attempted rescues within the structure that were pushed back by intense uh, flame and heat. The fire gutted the Victorian-style home that sits along the Long Island Sound. A well-known advertising executive, Madonna Badger, owns the house and escaped along with a male contractor who was helping with the renovation. But Badger's three daughters, a 10-year-old and twin 7-year-olds, and her parents could not get out. Her father died in the fire hours after spending Christmas Eve working as Santa Claus at Saks Fifth Avenue in New York City. It's a tragedy. It's tragic and it's heartbreaking. It's just so terribly sad. You know, you would hope that everybody would have gotten out at least. and so they'd be alive to enjoy another Christmas. Monday, neighbors dropped off flowers for the victims while investigators worked to figure out what sparked the deadly fire. Manuel Gallegas, CBS News. Now, the reason I put that in, Bill, that was not a chimney-related incident. You remember when this happened. And yes. after the investigation was done, this resulted from improper storage of fireplace ashes. If I remember right, they had stored ashes in the laundry room in a cardboard box. And this is what people do. And it's so disheartening to see this and the loss of life. I mean, you know, I don't know how I would feel if that was my grandchildren in there. And I'm sure you would go through the same thing. So yeah. what? Let, let's tell people, what do you advise them to do with their fireplace ashes, Bill? Let's, let's add that into this show. Well, this is a great piece of advice for consumers. Um, your ashes can remain hot for a significant period of time after you believe the fire has been out. Uh, significant period of time. Uh, they need to be removed from your fireplace and put in a metal container with a lid and taken away from any structures or anything that can uh, cause um, or, or, or can be impacted by the heat that could remain in that pail. Uh, until foreseeable future, or you can use water inside that bucket to, to put it out completely. Uh, but they should never be stored anywhere in or around the home or garages or sheds, uh, up against trees or up against fences. Uh, all these things can result in, in these losses that we're trying to prevent. And they shouldn't be just thrown outside either. Uh, a lot of people use ash in their gardens, and, and I'm not a gardener, so I'm not going to give you that advice. But putting hot ashes in your garden in the winter or the fall um, could actually result in combustion of debris that's on the ground and, and could spread to other things around your, your home or your property. So really it's about containment and, and water is our friend, um, but, but time is also our friend. So getting those things in a sealed bucket or metal bucket with a lid away from structures and, and using water to make sure they're completely out is completely advisable. Gotcha. You know, Bill, one of the data points that I've studied and come up with from being as, you know, a leader in the National Chimney Sweep Guild and president of CSI was the number of consumers that I feel have ever had a chimney professionally inspected and serviced. Mm -hmm. My feeling is less than 3% have ever had a professional inspection. And when you look around your community and the market area you serve, would you agree that less the probably less than 3% have ever been professionally inspected? I think that's probably an accurate number uh, many times. And, and I run three full-time inspection trucks. We're, we're out inspecting only um, for a majority of the year for lots of reasons, you, uh, issues that, that people have with their chimney or real estate transactions. And many of these chimneys, it is the first time they've ever been inspected. And some of these homes are 60, 70, even 100 hundred plus years. Some of my service area homes are, are were built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And, and we're inspecting many of those for maybe the first time based right. on some of the things that we're finding too. And that's, 
Um, yeah. So, Bill, just tell folks where you're from in New Jersey. So if they're looking you up and they want a qualified person to look at their chimney, which I can assure them you're a qualified person, you could also <laughs> recommend other people, I'm sure. Yes. So what town are you in and how would our listeners find you if they wanted to engage your services? The name of my company is Ryan and Son Chimney Contractors. We are located in Morris County, New Jersey, uh, the township of Roxbury, where I was actually born and raised. Um, and we service a very large area of New Jersey, most of uh, the state from Route 78 North. And if you need something south, I got a great guy down there. And if you need something way south, I got a great guy down there. So we can put you in touch with people that know what they're doing in regards to looking at your chimney. Right. So the big thing is, if a chimney service technician comes to your home, Bill, do you, along with my, with me, agree that they should be doing a video inspection of the interior of the chimney? I will say this as what I believe to be fact, 100% of the time, a camera should be used inside of your chimney. Okay. And looking around also when they come in, they should be taking pictures and explaining to you what they're finding in the chimney. Would you agree with that assessment? Yes. Part of the due diligence of an inspector is to start documenting things, even simple things that they want to talk with you about, not only for their records, but for yours. So yes, a, a use of a handheld digital camera uh, is part of the process and, and documenting the findings, uh, not just inside the chimney, but adjacent to as well. Right. And if you as a consumer do not understand what that tension neck niche is down, tell him, listen, I'm a consumer. I'm not a chimney expert. I don't know what a smoke chamber is. I don't know what a cricket is. I don't understand what you're talking about, about the inner hearth and the outer hearth and in the attic area and fire blocking and fire stopping. So talk to me in a language I can understand. Bill, yes. would you agree with that? Absolutely. It, it's so important because what our one of our functions is to educate the consumer about what we're finding because we are talking about chimneys. We want you to understand the findings. It is important to, to, to make sure it, it can be comprehended in a manner that helps you make the right decision for a an important appliance in your home. Yeah. Well, brother, is there anything else you'd like to add in today uh, to consumers? You know, I, I would suggest this. Springtime is a really fantastic time to have your chimney inspected and have maintenance performed or scheduled. Uh, it, it allows you to, to get uh, ahead of next fall. Um, and, and after this winter here in New Jersey and other parts of the country with power outages and crazy amounts of snowfall, uh, it may be time for you to make that decision to make things better or upgrade for uh, usage or put in a, an appliance that can heat in an emergency situation safely. So now's the time. Uh, and there are plenty of chimney contractors ready to serve you properly um, it, it all around the country. Well, Bill, I want to thank you for taking the time out of a busy day, joining me today. I, I have a feeling that me and you together on this show may have shocked a few people today. <laughs> uh, they probably don't understand that you and I are actually very respectful of each other's opinions and would actually consult with each other at times. So uh, I absolutely. really, yeah, I want to appreciate you being here. So this is Jerry Eisenhower. Our company is CVC Success Group. If we can help you, feel free to reach out to us today. And with that, Bill, we are out of here. Thanks, Jerry.